right, good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation on cultural perspectives as it relates to organ donation. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and as always, it's my pleasure to introduce today's program. Now, before we go ahead and get started, there are just a few logistical items that I'd like to discuss. First and foremost, to ensure an optimal visual and audio experience, we do highly recommend that you access our webinars using the Chrome browser. If you're already using Chrome and experience any audio issues, we do recommend reconnecting to the webinar using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. To anyone joining us for the very first time today, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat will be used to pose your questions to our speaker. So if you have any questions that come up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll go ahead and transition to our Q&A discussion where our presenter will address as many of your questions as time allows. Now for anyone interested in our upcoming webinars, please note registration is currently open for our special edition town hall that will highlight coping strategies for healthcare professionals in light of the recent COVID-19 outbreak. If you're interested in joining the discussion, please be sure to tune in for that on Thursday, April 16th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Please note, registration is limited and access will be granted on a first-come, first-served basis. Should we reach capacity, please feel free to tune in to our live stream of the presentation. The details will be included in your confirmation email. Additionally, registration is also open for our next transplant webinar, a hefty problem in transplant, uh, the OBC epidemic. That's coming your way on April 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern. For more information on all of our upcoming webinar offerings, and to ensure you have the latest information, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. For those of you who are seeking continuing education credits, we are offering one step C credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. Please note we do also offer a certificate of attendance for anyone seeking CEs that are not available. Everyone joining us today is eligible to claim either of these credits or certificates. Prior to receiving your certificate, you will be asked to complete a brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to provide us with your valuable feedback. If you're listening in a group, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a friendly reminder, you'll have 30 calendar days to complete your evaluations and claim your credit. Now, as an important note, throughout the course of today's presentation, there are a series of videos that will be shown. The sound from these videos will only project through your computer speakers. So if you're listening to today's program through the phone, please be sure to turn up the volume on your computer as well so that you're able to hear the discussion. As an added note, we'd also like to take this opportunity to advise you of the graphic nature of this presentation. While we understand that majority of our viewers are seasoned healthcare professionals, we do still strongly advise your discretion for this presentation. Now at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our moderator for today's program. Dr. Samir Latifi, Chair of the Department of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine at Cleveland Clinic Children's. Dr. Latifi, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and at this point I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce today's program. Great. Uh, thank you, Deanna. Um, uh, I am also the Associate Medical Director for LifeBank, so the OPO in Cleveland, um, and uh, it's great to be part of this webinar series. And um, being at the Cleveland Clinic, it's really my pleasure to introduce a colleague, Dr. Charles Modlin, um, who is a kidney transplant surgeon uh, and neurologist, uh, who did his training at Northwestern, uh, then residency um, at New York University, and then a fellowship in kidney transplantation at the Cleveland Clinic. And since then, he's been uh, a member of the Cleveland Clinic staff uh, since 1996. Uh, he's had a very accomplished career at the Cleveland Clinic. He's been the past president of the medical staff. Uh, he's a member of the Board of Governors and Board of Trustees as well. He founded and directed the Cleveland Clinic's Minority Health uh, Men's Health Center, and in 2003 established the Cleveland Clinic's annual Minority Men's Health Fair, um, and in 2011 was named by the Atlanta Post as one of the top 20 black doctors in America. Um, He's well respected in the, you know, in the field of transplantation and is also a noted uh, national leader for the eliminating health disparities as well as a strong national proponent for educating and informing the minority communities about the importance of donation and increasing minority access to kidney and organ transplantation. So it's my real pleasure to um, uh, hand over to Dr. Modlin for his presentation about perspectives uh, cultural perspectives in, uh, in African Americans and, or, and organ donation. 
Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Latifi. I'd like to thank you, uh, Deanna, and the Alliance for allowing me the opportunity to speak on a topic that is very uh, uh, important, I think, not only to me, but, but to our nation. Um, cultural perspectives with respect to organ donation and, and especially kidney transplantation in African-American populations. Um, and again, I appreciate the work that you're doing also, uh, Dr. Latifi at, at Cleveland Clinic and, and the remarkable leadership uh, you're, you're uh, exhibiting over at the Life Bank. I really appreciate uh, our partners at Life Bank, uh, uh, Gordon Bowen and, and the whole team over there. So I'm gonna get started. Um, so this is my contact information should anybody wish to uh, contact me directly. Um, I have my cell phone on there, my office number and my email. Uh, anybody who wishes to contact me, uh, please do so. This is a huge topic. I cannot really cover it uh, in detail uh, in one hour, uh, but I'm just going to touch on several different important issues um, pertaining to uh, cultural diversity and organ donation in African Americans. So this uh, slide, and I, I know you're going to get a copy of the slides uh, in your syllabus, all of the uh, attendees, it really just describes um, the overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, African Americans comprise about 11% of the, um, um, actually about 13% of the U.S. population, about 11% of living organ donors, um, yet uh, approximately uh, represent about 34% of those uh, waiting to receive a kidney on national kidney transplant waiting list, so that's a huge disparity right there. Uh, there are many barriers to organ donation among um, uh, minorities and especially African Americans that include uh, basically uh, decreased awareness of uh, transplantation as an option to treat kidney disease and also organ donation, uh, whether living um, or deceased. Uh, there's c cultural mistrust of the medical community. We're going to go into some of these uh, issues in detail. Financial concerns, social determinants of health uh, concerns, fear of the donor operation, and in African American populations, uh, in many respects, uh, African Americans have fewer living donor candidate options because many of their potential living donor candidates also themselves are afflicted either with kidney disease or, or conditions that predispose them uh, to developing kidney disease. And so we're going to discuss these barriers and discuss interventions in which we can employ to uh, promote organ donation in uh, uh, minority communities. So next slide, we're going to, and these are the course objectives. Um, again, you will get this in your syllabus. I uh, won't uh, read over all of these, um, but we have several different course objectives that we'd like um, um, to achieve uh, during the course of this uh, conversation. I wanted to start off by acknowledging um, my father, uh, uh, Charles Modlin Sr. He was my inspiration in everything I did along with my mother, uh, Grace Modlin. My father, um, passed in 2010, uh, but he um, still holds the uh, national records in the National Senior Games Association for men above 80 in uh, track and field, uh, setting uh, four records in the, uh, for the 100, 200, 400 uh, yard dashes as well as the long jump. So I really always recognize him whenever I speak. So in speaking of um, minorities in the United States as far as the general population, um, the working definition, African Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, you can see that over the years the percentage of the population that is uh, considered to be minority is rapidly uh, increasing in the United States to where by the year 2045 it is estimated and anticipated that minorities uh, will assume the majority percentage of the population. So when we're talking about issues pertaining to minorities, it, it is really in the best interest of the overall nation that we talk about these issues. And, and when it, with respect to healthcare disparities, it's important that we uh, discuss ways in which to mitigate these healthcare disparities because pretty soon, uh, as you can see with the population dynamics, um, these minorities are gonna represent the majority population. And so these are going to become majority population uh, health concerns. So with the growing diversity in America comes a national crisis. And I pose the question, why is, the, why is there a national crisis? And I already mentioned it is because the incidence of healthcare disparities that are afflicting minority populations. This slide just shows some examples 
of the um, common health care disparities that African American African Americans experience in, in comparison to the general population each year. For example, 44% uh, more African Americans die from cancers, a variety of cancers. 30% more die from heart disease. Uh, much greater incidence of, of death from stroke and, and recurrent stroke. Um, again, heart disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, and many other conditions uh, are more prevalent in African American populations. And of course, kidney disease, which we're going to go into. Um, and in fact, these healthcare disparities collectively together uh, contribute to the fact that African Americans, uh, compared to uh, Caucasian Americans in particular, have a five to eight year shorter life expectancy compared to uh, white Americans. And that is not just uh, isolated in the uh, impoverished, it actually, these healthcare disparities actually even afflict uh, even more economically advantaged uh, African Americans compared to the general population. Again, um, hypertension is a, a significant uh, health disparity in, in, in African American populations. Um, in various areas of the country, um, different age groups, it's estimated that a, fully a third of African Americans suffer from hypertension. In many situations, it is uh, untreated. The general uh, uh, incidence of hypertension is about 20%. And untreated uh, hypertension, we all know, can lead to kidney disease, stroke, hypertension, uh, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease. Um, smoking in African Americans, um, even though African Americans smoke fewer cigarettes and start smoking on average about three years later in life, it's demonstrated that African Americans have a harder time quitting uh, uh, smoking. Uh, there's a different uh, differential um, uh, metabolism of, of the uh, carcinogens uh, and the pollutants in, in cigarette smoke. Uh, and research has shown in African American populations. Also, in many respects, um, African American communities are marketed uh, cigarettes that are higher in nicotine, and uh, African Americans oftentimes are less likely referred or have access to smoking cessation programs. The reason I, m I mention uh, smoking in the context of this talk is that um, we all know that, Afri that, that patients who are going to be candidates to receive uh, a kidney transplant and other organs, uh, it, it's uh, necessary that they uh, are not actively smoking. And so this disadvantages uh, many African Americans respect to even qualify um, to be evaluated for a kidney transplant. Uh, looking at some disparities in cancer, uh, higher rates of the four most common cancers in African Americans, and when when contemplating referral and a placement on a on a kidney transplant waiting list, there are generally mandatory waiting times from which a patient uh, has been diagnosed with cancer and, and cured of the cancer before they can actually be qualified uh, to be put on that transplant waiting list or receive uh, even a living donor kidney. So. Diabetes, hypertension are the leading causes of kidney disease uh, in, in all populations, especially African Americans. I basically have on this slide the uh, differential diagnosis or the incidence of di diagnosis of diabetes in the United States in, in blacks versus whites. And also in, in Ohio, you can see a remarkable in, uh, increased incidence of diabetes um, throughout the United States and especially in Ohio. There's a greater risk of African Americans uh, in developing um, kidney disease and also kidney failure. It's three times greater a rate uh, in African Americans uh, to develop kidney failure than Caucasian uh, Americans. Uh, about 35% of all patients in the United States receiving dialysis are African Americans. Again, uh, the black population in the United States is uh, uh, anywhere between 11 and, and 13%. So remarkable disparity there. R remarkable uh, number of uh, African Americans and kidney failure on dialysis. Again, um, uh, African Americans are twice as likely to develop the diabetes as Caucasian Americans. Uh, in fact, um, the type of diabetes most, most common in African Americans is type 2 uh, diabetes, also known as adult onset diabetes. And <clears throat> this is uh, not really commonly spoken about, um, but uh, there are a number of um, uh, uh, deceased donors um, who young, young deceased donors who actually um, donate uh, both kidneys and pancreases. And this actually disadvantages uh, many African Americans from, with the respect that those kidney pancreas combined organ transplants go to individuals with type 1 diabetes. Um, and so African Americans are disadvantaged in receiving those young kidneys um, because less African Americans have type 2 
or type 1 diabetes, excuse me. So also we know um, minorities in general have less access to health care than other populations. And also Hispanic Latinos uh, is, have less access to health care. Um, one out of four um, black Americans uh, are, un are, are uninsured. We see it also in American Indians, Alaskan Natives. And um, so this, this is a, um, a barrier to transplantation, barrier to uh, being an organ donor. Um, in terms of being evaluated and listed to receive a kidney transplant and then go on to receive a kidney transplant, um, it's been published in the literature. There are barriers uh, among the candidates who would otherwise be deemed appropriate uh, transplant candidates uh, that African Americans are less likely to be referred uh, to receive a kidney transplant evaluation either by their primary care provider or their nephrologist, and there are variable reasons for this. Uh, once evaluated, African Americans are less likely to be listed for transplant. In many respects, uh, they're less likely to actually complete the transplant evaluation once listed, less likely to actually receive the transplant. Post-transplant have a, in some instances, a 50% higher uh, incidence of rejection and then following transplant in many instances have a lower patient and, and graft survival. And uh, also it's been shown in, um, in the literature, African Americans uh, on the waiting list wait two to four times longer than white Americans to actually receive the kidney transplant. And it, it's um, not a real simple uh, uh, maneuver or thing to actually be evaluated and to actually receive the transplant. There's a complex uh, array of outpatient interviews and medical screenings that individuals have to go through if they want to receive a transplant or if they want to be a living donor um, for a, a loved one, family member, um, or, or non-related uh, individual. Um, many minorities have limited resources. There are social determinants of health. Uh, many individuals, whether they want to be a living donor or uh, receive a kidney, may have lack of transportation, uh, lack of medical or dental insurance, or uh, poor uh, insurance. Um, that uh, may not cover uh, the transplant or the post-transplant medication, um, poverty, education levels, family support, um, job support. Th these are all things that transplant centers um, evaluate the, the patients for uh, when they're undergoing uh, evaluation to receive a transplant or if they're uh, undergoing an evaluation to determine their suitability to um, serve as a, a living donor. Also, African Americans historically are, are more highly sensitized than their white American counterparts, meaning that um, in many instances, um, uh, black females have had more pregnancies. Uh, many African Americans have had more blood transfusions. Uh, th these can actually level uh, or increase the uh, levels of uh, preformed antibodies that sometimes or oftentimes will make it more difficult to match uh, individuals up um, with, a, with a donor kidney um, or even increase um, incompatibility between a prospective um, living donor um, and a, uh, their potential recipient. So I asked the question, why do racial renal transplant um, recipient living donor disparities exist? Well, they're multifactorial um, <clears throat> uh, factors, uh, healthcare provider, healthcare system factors, uh, patient factors, um, again, social determinants, uh, lack of health literacy, uh, poverty, a, a cultural distrust. Um, again, there are dispar disproportionately more African Americans with end-stage renal disease and who need kidney transplants. Uh, and also, in considering, uh, as I mentioned before, individuals who would like to serve as a living donor, um, they're mo more often themselves afflicted with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, or other healthcare disparities. And so, in many situations, they don't qualify to uh, serve as a living donor. So historically, many have felt that the organ allocation system um, whereby one uh, is allocated a, to receive a, a deceased donor kidney is unfair uh, to um, uh, minority populations. And it was based on historically the uh, HLA uh, matching system. But recently, it was in uh, 2016, I believe, or 2014, uh, UNOS changed the uh, policy to, to, to uh, de-emphasize the uh, significance of the HLA-B uh, matching, and that was uh, designed to help promote more equity uh, so that more African Americans uh, would be able to receive um, these deceased donor uh, kidneys. And also, um, and again, I, I can discuss this more in more detail uh, later, um, 
the matching system actually um, was modified to include the number of years that an individual spent on uh, dialysis even prior um, to uh, undergoing uh, renal transplant evaluation. And, and this was all designed uh, to promote more access to, to uh, deceased donor uh, allografts or, or, or kidney donors um, for minority populations. There are some other reasons for refusal, refusal or denial of donation, uh, either by uh, individuals uh, uh, who may not be willing to sign up on the organ donor list uh, um, to, to uh, donate their organs uh, following their death, or uh, by families who may refuse to uh, donate their loved one's organs uh, following death, or individuals who may not be willing to um, um, be, uh, serve as living donors. Religious uh, mis misconceptions uh, and misperceptions about the organ donor process. Um, there is, and we've done focus groups on this uh, in Northeast Ohio, and it's really remarkable um, that some individuals still do uh, believe, and I've seen this both in, in white and black populations, uh, more so in black populations, that if you sign that organ donor card, then if doctors see that you that you have signed this card, if you show up in an ICU emergency room, and they see that, then they're going to more be more willing to uh, let you die just so that they can retrieve your organs. That is uh, an outright uh, misconception. I think um, everybody in the audience, um, we have a responsibility to help um, um, uh, present to the community uh, true facts about the organ donation process. Um, so that we can dispel a lot of these uh, myths and misconceptions. Um, <clears throat> so, again, there, there's, there's evidence in the literature that African Americans are still more likely than Caucasian Americans to receive kidney transplants from deceased donors rather than living donors. So one thing that we need to do in the transplant community is to educate the uh, minority communities about the merits of receiving uh, living uh, uh, kidney uh, donation over deceased uh, kidney donation. And I'm going to go more into that as uh, the uh, during the presentation. Um, it's really preferred um, a living kidney donation is preferred over deceased donation, and even in living kidney donation, it there is an advantage of receiving a preemptive uh, uh, living donor transplant. And a preemptive transplant just means that you're referred for a transplant evaluation prior to uh, needing to go on dialysis. And when we talk about organ donation, I, I think it's important that we educate those candidates who need a kidney transplant to uh, approach their loved ones, family members. It's up to them. We, we, the transplant center, uh, we cannot uh, do that for them uh, ethically, but we, we can actually educate them about uh, how to go about uh, approaching their loved ones um, to be potential living donors. And then uh, we are available, the transplant center is available transplant communities available uh, should they wish to call us and, and we can answer their questions. Um, we've done um, uh, seminars uh, in, association, in association with the National Kidney Foundation uh, and Life Bank. National Kidney Foundation puts on a uh, national uh, 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 workshops uh, called the, uh, the Big Ask um, so that individuals would, would be able to uh, uh, be empowered to ask their loved ones to uh, consider uh, serving as living donors. So I just wanted to highlight some of the health care disparities that um, disproportionately uh, prevent African Americans and other minorities from receiving kidney transplants that actually prevent um, or um, lower the, the options for African Americans to serve as living donors. It's important that we know what these uh, issues are, uh, but it's not enough to know that these issues exist. We actually have to try to develop um, um, programs um, and initiatives to alleviate a lot of these uh, obstacles. And, and so the solutions are multifaceted um, and overdue. There are a number of things I think that we can, um, there are a number of things we can do collectively and individually uh, to help combat this program. Uh, Dr. King, um, back in 1966, was well ahead of the curve when he said, all, of all forms of inequity and justice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Um, and at Cleveland Clinic, we've initiated uh, what, what I call a multi or a, a minority organ donation and kidney transplant initiative. And again, that's to uh, increase access to health care um, and promotion of uh, 
um, organ donation, living and deceased in, in minority populations. So the one thing that we have to do, and again, this is a multifaceted, this is not just unique to the organ donation and transplant, but also to elimination of healthcare disparities in general. Uh, one of the first things we have to do is recognize uh, that the problem exists and we have to um, develop initiatives to educate our, our health um, care uh, colleagues uh, about the problem because it may be intuitive that all health care providers would be aware of this issue, but um, unfortunately they are not. And so at Cleveland Clinic, we established our uh, Congress and Lewis Stokes Health Equity Lecture Forum back in 2006, and that's just to raise awareness about health care disparities. We work with various um, governmental and, and community agencies and other organizations to get the word out. I had the pleasure of serving on the Ohio Commission on Minority Health um, uh, as a board member for 12 years. Um, we actually have a special series in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine um, entitled Addressing uh, Disparities in Healthcare, because again, we, we need to educate other healthcare providers about the um, disparities involving minority populations. It's very important that we establish a, 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 a rapport with the community in which we try uh, to serve. And that's going to require that we practice culturally sensitive and culturally competent healthcare and that we listen to the community in terms of what their needs are um, and that we invite them into the healthcare process. We need to build trusting relationships if we're going to effectively engage them uh, in this process to help improve their health outcomes. One of the uh, signature programs that we established at, at Cleveland Clinic back in uh, 2003, which has allowed us to touch more lives, is our annual Minority Men's Health Fair. Um, it's a men's health fair because it, it uh, emanated in the Department of Urology and our initial target disease was prostate cancer. Um, but now we've expanded that to uh, include uh, uh, free health screenings uh, for men of all races and ethnicities. We primarily target uh, men of color because they have the highest incidence of healthcare disparities. It's usually uh, held in, in April during Minority Health Month. Unfortunately, we, we had to uh, uh, cancel that uh, this spring because of the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But um, this is a picture of, of thousands of men who actually have shown up to our health fair uh, over the years. We, our health fair over the years have actually allowed us to touch approximately over 35,000 men. Again, three preventative health screenings uh, for all men. We're trying to improve their health literacy, and ultimately we're trying to empower them to uh, partner with us to promote uh, their own improved health outcomes. The, the, when we talk about organ donation and transplantation, there are not enough organs to go around to meet the needs of individuals, of uh, everybody who needs a kidney transplant. Uh, there's probably approximately 120,000 individuals on the kidney transplant waiting list, yet we only see 25,000 to 30,000 uh, kidney transplants per year. So you can see we have a prolonged waiting list. Increasingly, numbers, uh, more, more people, indivi individuals need kidney transplants. So the best uh, solution is to avoid uh, the onset of kidney disease in the first place. So we need to educate individuals about diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Um, many of these individuals have these conditions. They're not diagnosed until late stages. And hypertension and diabetes, uh, an individual can have and not have any symptoms or even know that they have a, a, these uh, serious conditions. So we have to constantly uh, focus on prevention. Um, it's all about um, uh, culturally competent, sensitive, uh, patient-centered uh, health care. We have to show compassion to everyone, uh, all individuals. We, we need to facilitate access to care. A lot of individuals don't know how to access the health system, even if they are insured. Um, at Cleveland Clinic, we actually have charity assistance program. I know uh, the other hospitals do as well. Um, and we need to let people know that they actually can access the healthcare system. It's all about early detection of disease. Uh, again, patient navigation, we need to assist uh, individuals. We need to actually go out into the community and educate individuals. We can't just sit in the hospital and wait for patients to come uh, see us. Early detection of, the, of disease can save lives. I'm actually very grateful uh, for the uh, uh, volunteerism that we've uh, had over the years at Cleveland Clinic that has allowed us to conduct our minority men's health fair. Um, and again, we screen for a variety of conditions. Um, the main point is uh, that I want to make to healthcare providers is that we need to 
continue. There are going to be barriers to accessing the community. Uh, it's it's got to be an ongoing process. We have to be vigilant. We have to be committed to improving the health of the community. As I said, um, the health of minorities actually transcends the overall health of the nation. Um, I have this is a, a, a short video I'm going to show that talks about some of the barriers when it comes to African Americans' willingness to sign up um, to be organ donors uh, at the um, uh, Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Um, we did some research years ago. Uh, my partner, uh, Carla Manzarlo Zaramo, um, around how you know what are some of the ways in which the transplant um, community and, and medical community can actually uh, better engage uh, individuals to encourage them to sign up on the organ donor registry. Uh, historically, the, uh, the, the way in which we tried to accomplish this is what was to go to the BMVs, um, you know, across the state, throughout the, the country, and, uh, you know, have signage uh, information that we would hand out to the patrons. But we took a different approach. In this particular uh, uh, program, we partnered up with Life Bank of Ohio, and our goal was not to um, interact with the patrons. We did that also, but our main goal was to better educate the, the workers in the BMBs in terms of how to better uh, ask uh, or inquire if uh, individuals would want to uh, be an organ donor. I, I've registered um, um, for a new driver's license uh, multiple times, and, and in most situations, I'm never asked. Uh, so we need to. Th this is an innovative way in which we uh, saw great results, uh, especially at Wade Park, which is predominantly African American uh, BMV. So we're going to show this uh, video here real quick. Um, I'm not sure if I have the controls to. That's going to be the next. Okay, it's going. The video is loading here. Uh, click play. Just as a reminder okay, to everyone, to hear the audio from this uh, video, you will need to have your computer speakers turned on. So for those of you that are on the phone, please be sure to um, turn on your computer speakers for this video. Okay, thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Smith. You've passed your driver's test. Would you like to register as an organ donor? Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith? They promised they'd give him the heart transplant. The heart attack came early. They said there was nothing that they could do. So the doctors let Dad die? Mom, I'm scared of dying. Sometimes, I think the doctors let Dad die. Honey, the doctors did all they could do. Your uncle needs a lung transplant. Will the doctors make sure he gets one? He's on the waiting list, no guarantee. Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith? Would you like to register as an organ donor? Nah, I'm good. So that, that actually video was, uh, we did some uh, work with some students at, at Cleveland Clinic, and that was a uh, artistic rendition, rendition um, that they actually came up with um, in, 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 in interpreting the, the research findings uh, out in the community in terms of an unwillingness of many African Americans to sign up uh, on the organ donor registry. So this was a publication that we uh, actually published in the Journal of the National Medical Association based on our research. Uh, and again, this will be in your syllabus if you uh, want to take uh, time to pull that uh, transplant proceedings article. Uh, you can do so. 
Um, in terms of addressing the uh, health disparities, we, we need to be politically active as well. Um, and this is just evidence that we've gone to the Ohio State House, uh, the United States Congress, the Congressional Black Congress, Congress um, to advocate for the elimination of health disparities. Uh, most recently, uh, I served on the National Board of the National Kidney Foundation, and the National Kidney Foundation has been very active in terms of uh, lobbying uh, congressional leaders um, to promote uh, changes in, in um, the UNOS policy. Most recently, uh, they've been very active in, in terms of uh, helping uh, raise awareness in, in our national leaders about the kidney discard rate. Um, presently, there are approximately 300 kidneys that the U.S. transplant centers do not use that we feel could be actually successfully transplanted uh, in individuals of need. The reason uh, these kidneys are discarded is because of the uh, potential uh, re repercussions that, that transplant centers face if transplanting these kidneys and if there were suboptimal uh, outcomes, uh, the outcomes uh, lower than what the estimated or projections should be. You know, these kidneys are, are, are kidneys maybe from older individuals. Um, we feel, you know, transplant surgeons and transplant, uh, the transplant community feels that uh, uh, the, the transplant centers should uh, uh, have the um, flexibility of utilizing these kidneys and, and the, the patients that they uh, deem appropriate to receive these kidneys. You know, for example, older individuals receiving uh, uh, kidneys from older individuals. And, and so due to this uh, political activism, uh, there are changes uh, uh, being looked at and being made uh, so that these 3,000 kidneys will not be discarded and actually will be utilized to help save lives. So again, I talked about how the, there's a new kidney allocation system. Again, it was designed to uh, take into account the fact that minorities uh, are waiting longer on these on, on dialysis and, and uh, prior to receiving uh, evaluations for transplant. Uh, so it's a point system that de-emphasizes HLA-B uh, matching, and it takes more into consideration of the duration uh, that individuals have been on dialysis. Uh, this is a, an effective way to promote the number of years, uh, life years that are experienced following transplantation and, and improved and more equitable access to um, um, deceased donor transplants. Um, the data is still out in terms of the overall effectiveness of the, this new kidney allocation system. But it's believed that uh, there is uh, a benefit uh, in minority populations uh, because of this uh, new allocation system. So we need to wait and see, uh, give more time to actually see what the ultimate result of this new allocation system is going to be. So this is an example of uh, one of our focus uh, groups uh, that we conduct uh, in, in partnership with Life Bank of Ohio uh, to determine what some of the um, myths and misconceptions or, or thoughts about organ donation, organ donation are in the uh, black community. And um, I'm not gonna play this whole thing. It was Albert Einstein um, uh, who was quoted as saying, play, uh, the definition of, of insanity is actually um, doing the same thing over and over again, uh, but expecting uh, different results. Portion, uh, um, so the group of us, we got together to try to figure out what we could do differently to increase the number of transplants that are available to African Americans, I'm not sure how to fast especially in, in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. And we came up with this concept of having these focus groups so that we could actually hear from you, the community, to, to get feedback we'll from, play from your perspective to see you know, what the problems are, what, what are the barriers. And we've learned quite a bit. We started doing these focus groups maybe four or six months ago. And really, you are the answer. You, you guys are giving us the answer in terms of how we can better approach the community to disseminate the information, the education, the knowledge out there so that we can really encourage more people to become organ donors. Well, I'm not sure how to fast forward donors. this, but there's a segment My name is Teleon J. Thomas. I'm going to be serving as your facilitator, and basically that means I'm going to help guide the conversation for the today. This video that I um, want to today's highlight conversation is part of a research study, and as some of you may be aware, there's multiple elements to research. It's not always in a, in a lab setting, but sometimes it's in this setting where um, researchers come out into the community hopefully to gain new knowledge and perspective around health issues or otherwise um, so that we can be better in terms of providing interventions, solutions, 
or programs and services to help people improve their health or the health of the neighborhoods, et cetera. So in the case of today, we're talking about organ and tissue donation. Um, hopefully it's a topic that you might be somewhat familiar with, but we really are just interested in knowing what you do know, and more importantly, what are your perceptions, beliefs, and understandings and or experience around the issues of organ and tissue donation. As mentioned, this is a research study. It's being coordinated by the Cleveland Clinic um, in partnership with Life Bank of Ohio. Uh, the principal investigator's name is Dr. Charles Motlin, and we'll share some more with you about who he is. Um, but he is a resource right here in this community that hopefully you are familiar with. Um, and again, I'm serving um, as a consultant to this project, and so my job is to come out and meet wonderful people like you. Um, and just really have a conversation to learn what you know and hopefully take that information back so that we can begin to address the issue um, and engage the community more broadly and more effectively around things like organ and tissue donation. What are some of the myths or misconceptions, rumors or otherwise, that um, people may have about organ donation? They kill you. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hesitate to jump right in there, huh? That's what they said. Okay. So young lady said they kill you. If you sign up on that organ donor registry, they, they will kill you. That, that's, that was the first uh, thing that she said, and, and that thought process is really prevalent, in, especially in the minority communities. So it, again, it's important that we dispel these myths and, and uh, make people understand that that in no way is the case. Um, in order to address eliminate these, elimination of these healthcare disparities, um, we actually have to get out and educate the family members of our patients about uh, the disease processes that their loved ones have had. Of course, we have to have uh, permission to do so because of the HIPAA laws, but in most instances, patients uh, nowadays uh, will actually allow us to talk with other family members. And many other family members are there at the pres and present in the examination room uh, at the time of evaluation for, for kidney uh, recipients and donors. People need to know that their loved ones developed hypertension, diabetes that caused their kidney disease, so they themselves um, should understand that they should seek medical attention to screen for these conditions so that they will not be in the same situation as their, as their loved ones. So we actually have um, partnered with Cleveland Clinic Corporate Communications and the uh, uh, local media here in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio uh, to promote uh, living uh, kidney donation in African Americans. And this is just a, a snippet of um, a, a profile of a, of a uh, donor and recipient, living donor and recipient uh, that were featured on Cleveland uh, television. Uh, these individuals actually uh, flew up to Cleveland Clinic uh, from the Bahamas. Delon um, Brennan and Curtis Newbold are Bohemian brothers, not related by name or by blood, but by collegiate ties. Curtis and I have been friends since 97 or 98. Um, just kind of met, we're both um, fraternity brothers. He and I just kind of clicked, you know, we, we talked. This patient is a police other. officer, the recipient. We, we just in the went on from there. It, it's been a bond ever since. The fraternal bond between brothers became even stronger when Curtis's kidney started failing four years ago. He needed a transplant. And, uh, we always said, you know, if it ever came down to that, just let us know. And once it happened, just went, got tested, found out we were compatible, and truthfully, it seemed like a pretty easy decision from there. According to national statistics, minorities represent more than half of the people waiting for organs. And due to a higher incidence of chronic kidney disease in the African American population, Curtis faced an uphill battle. Had his friend not stepped forward to donate, he may have been relegated to waiting for, you know, five years, ten years. You really don't know how long he would have had to wait. Blacks wait about two to four times as long to receive a transplant. So it was really remarkable that he stepped forward. With the match confirmed, the longtime friends wasted little time traveling. So I just wanted to show a segment of that. And actually, this is another quick story that we'll show just to we'll show the whole thing. Two Ohio brothers are now linked by more than the usual brotherly bond. They are connected by a life-saving surgery. And as Harry Boomer found out, that's just the beginning of their remarkable story. It was uh. The big brother I always looked up to. Now, Damien Tibbs, a life. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that it's very important that we project to the community that this is taking place, that yes, African-Americans do donate 
um, living donor kidneys because a lot of people are not aware that it's that is it's an option. They're not aware, in fact, that other African Americans are doing it. So we actually need to partner with our, our uh, media and marketing and corporate communications uh, partners to get the word out. Since the advent of minimally invasive uh, laparoscopic uh, living donor surgery, we've seen more people be willing to serve as living donors. Uh, there's a, it's a less invasive procedure. The uh, hospitalization is, is uh, much shortened. The recovery time is quicker. Uh, we all know, um, and the community may not know, that the uh, recipient's insurance pays for the uh, living donor operation. Uh, there are some individuals who may live a distance away from the transplant center, and there are, there are programs uh, that are available to assist in their travel and, and, and lodging uh, for themselves and their family when they come for their evaluations. Uh, all of this is done to encourage and try to break down the barriers for, for people to uh, serve as living donors. So we've actually wanted to look at our own outcomes at Cleveland Clinic in terms of what are the results of an experience of our transplanting African Americans over a 10-year period uh, at, at Cleveland Clinic. These are um, um, the authors of our research. We looked at a number of uh, patients, um, 700 patients who received living donor allografts and 700 patients receiving um, deceased donor allografts, uh, first, first time transplants over a 10-year period. Uh, 2003, 2013, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but the bottom line, I'm going to just summarize. You're going to get these slides in your syllabus. Um, we saw that in recipients of deceased donor allografts, African Americans had a poorer outcome at all time points, uh, Yet, uh, and that was significant. Uh, yet in African Americans who received a living donor allograph, there was equivalent graft survival, allograft survival in in African Americans versus their European American counterparts. And so the take home message from that was that um, we need to encourage more African Americans to identify uh, living donors. We need to encourage more of the black community, minority community about the option for living donation and the merits and how they can benefit uh, their, their loved ones by doing so. They can live out normal lifespans uh, after having donated uh, one of their kidneys. And so, you know, it's all about education. I think uh, through uh, uh, aggressive educational campaigns, media marketing campaigns, we can actually increase the availability of living donor kidneys uh, in our minority populations. And so uh, there are other ways in which we can increase and promote um, access to organ donation, uh, both living and deceased, and that's uh, uh, utilizing the expanded criteria donor kidneys. And, and uh, these are just some extra um, you may just be interested in seeing how we, we place the kidney. This is some schematics. Uh, this is a kidney that is being prepared, a renal allograph. Um, we can use kidneys from old, older donors, We call and we can use uh, both kidneys instead of just one kidney. We call those dual uh, renal uh, uh, transplantation. We can reconstruct kidneys that have multiple arteries. There are some uh, kidney transplant centers out there uh, that will not uh, transplant or accept uh, deceased donor kidneys with multiple arteries at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we've been um, quite uh, innovative in, in reconstructing um, arteries with uh, kidneys with multiple arteries so that we can utilize these kidneys have uh, great outcomes. Um, this is just a kidney um, with uh, three arteries. Uh, you can try. You can make those art out there. Um, let's see, this is a kidney. With four arteries. Um, again, these are ways in which we can re reconstruct the venous system, the ur ureteric system. This is a schematic in terms of what is a dual renal allograft. Not all centers perform these. And again, this is a way to expand the organ donor pool. Uh, use kidneys that previously were discarded. These are just uh, these are kidneys from. Um, uh, unfortunately, we we do see uh, children that that uh, pass away. And uh, we have a, a long uh, series of transplanting these kidneys on block, uh, which means we take both kidneys and implant them into an adult. Over a period of time, those kidneys will grow to 70% of a normal adult size. You can see how small they are compared to the size of my, uh, my fingers there. Those are called pediatric on block kidneys. We, can, we reconstruct those. Um, that's the schematic in terms of what they look like uh, once they're implanted. Um, these kidneys have been implanted uh, into the recipient here. 
Uh, you can see, how, again, how small they are in comparison to my fingers, my thumb. Uh, we've actually uh, used kidneys that other, other centers may have discarded in the past with capsular injuries. Um, this is a kidney that um, the capsule, a significant portion of the capsule, had been disrupted during uh, organ donation. We uh, innovated the uh, use of a vicro mesh to reconstruct the renal capsule, and that uh, proved to be successful. We actually published the results on that as well. This is a head of our kidney import. Uh, it had a capsular tear. We used a vicro. And that was transplanted successfully. Published. We published our results in the uh, literature. We've used kidneys with renal artery aneurysm. You can see the aneurysm uh, right there in a the living donor kidney on the angiogram. We excised the, you can see the sacular aneurysm. Uh, we excised it. You can see the repair. And then we transplanted it. Um, so, no, I just wanted to quickly go over what are some of the issues and barriers that prevent African Americans from being uh, transplant recipient candidates, and what are some of the barriers and, uh, which impede uh, individuals in the, in the black community from serving as living donors. A lot of it rests around our responsibility as a transplant community to educate people about the different options uh, for organ donation, the importance of organ donation, uh, both living and deceased. And we wanted to um, leave some time for questions. Um, and again, I appreciate having the opportunity to present this very important topic. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Modlin. Um, we're now gonna go ahead and open the floor up for questions, but before I turn it back to Dr. Latifi to facilitate our Q&A discussion, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you do have any questions, please be sure to submit them using the chat feature. Just as a reminder, it's located on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, additionally, during the Q&A session, I'm going to have this poll up. So for those of you who may be listening in a group, if you could please just complete this poll and let us know how many people are participating in your respective group. Um, that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it back to Dr. Latifi. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Deanna, and uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Modlin. That was a, a really great um, presentation and sharing with us uh, your thoughts about and really educating all of us about the discrepancies um, that exist for minorities and sort of transplantation, but also I think, as you rightly stated, in, um, in many other healthcare um, sort of parameters, such as just like blood pressure and cancer as well. Um, so while we're waiting for people to type out questions, I actually had a, um, a question to ask you. Um, I noticed in your study that you did that um, the deceased donor kidneys, there was a sort of difference in outcome um, with those who are not African American. and um, do you think the kind of ongoing study right now about the APO, uh, lipoprotein 1 gene study in donors is, is something that's going to be important in the future? Yeah, I, I, I very much do, and, and, and thank you for that question. Um, because I, I mentioned that the leading um, causes for kidney disease and kidney failure, need for kidney transplantation, or, or diabetes and hypertension, it's just most recently been known that uh, some of these cases may not be actually related to either hypertension or diabetes, uh, may be related, especially when we're talking about African-American population, black populations. It may be related to a hereditary um, a gene um, called apolipoprotein 1. Uh, and again, this is uh, just being researched now. It, it really hasn't been known um, quite that long, but uh, it's, Individuals can inherit uh, uh, this gene, you know, you inherit genes, one from your mother, one from your father, and if you inherit uh, both variants of that, your, your risk as, as an African American for developing um, chronic kidney disease and kidney failure uh, exponentially uh, is increased. And, and so, you know, in the future, I think we're going to do more gene testing or genetic testing um, to help determine actually what is the initial cause of the kidney failure in one given individual rather than automatically attribute it to either diabetes or hypertension or both. It also has ramifications in terms of potential living donors, uh, black living donors, um, who should probably also be tested to see if they harbor um, any um, evidence of, of this uh, apolipoprotein 1 or apo um, one L1 gene. 
um, because they could be at increased risk if they actually harbor that. So yeah, that, that's actually a timely question. You know, research is underway to uh, better define actually how that is going to be used clinically. Great. Um, right, we have a question from uh, Safiha, and her quest, uh, is, uh, what do you attribute um, to the large participation in your health fairs? It looks like she was quite impressed by the, the picture you showed of our uh, lobby to the um, Miller Pavilion being totally full. Uh, oh, thank how, you. Thank how do you market, how, yeah, the question is, really, how do you market these fairs, and how do you encourage? And, sure. So, in 2003, we started our health fair. It's interesting. We had about 35 men show up at the health fair, which I thought at the time was a good turnout. Um, but it's really a matter of um, realizing that we can't really do this alone as healthcare providers. We need to actually engage outside organizations, uh, churches, uh, elected officials, um, influential people in the community to actually help uh, deliver the message about the importance of preventative health screening. So it's it's um, the success of the health fair also is, is related to the uh, remarkable volunteers who step forward to give of their time and their, and their talents. So it's a collective process. Um, um, and over the years, uh, we've, we've done this for 18 years now. Over the years, um, the word is being spread amongst the community, and, and they actually highly anticipate the health fair every year. And so it's about educating the community about the importance of preventative health screenings and uh, to empower them to uh, step up and, and um, take hold of their own health. So I really appreciate that question. Um, it's a labor of love for all of us, and, and um, you know we we really enjoy doing it. Right. Um, we have a, another question. Actually, it's, it's kind of like a follow-up to the uh, April one I was asking. Um, it's a bit more mm -hmm. specific. It was this is uh, what is your stance on uh, genetic testing for um, for the gene on all potential donors, and mm -hmm. um, is that protecting African American donors, or, or do you think it might be a hindrance to donation? Right. Um, it, the, 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 it's a difficult question because, in many respects, and actually most respects, we know that because um, we have not been testing for it, you know, historically, and we still have used uh, deceased donor. Um, allografts or, or, you know, kidneys from African-American donors, uh, one potential disadvantage is that we might be persuaded as a transplant community to, to not use uh, kidneys from African-Americans who harbor this gene. Um, so we may be doing a disadvantage in decreasing the organ donor supply. Um, one, um, one strategy would be potentially to use those kid kidneys in older individuals, older recipients. Um, unfortunately, also, um, not every medical system is actually uh, testing individuals or doesn't actually have the capability of, of doing the test. Um, to my knowledge, most insurance companies don't pay for the test. Again, this is something that we need to lobby our elected officials and insurance companies to, to uh, provide for that. I wanted to um, highlight Dr. Hernan Rincon, uh, who is uh, leading our initiative to um, to lobby this uh, with our governmental officials. Uh, Dr. Cedor, John Cedor, is also doing research in this area. Um, but yes, it can have um, potentially um, negative consequences um, in terms of reducing the organ donor pool. Uh, but if used responsibly, you know, I, I think um, um, it's something that we actually should, that should be our goal, that we should test all of our deceased donors and, and obviously our living donors as well. Yes, uh, um, I would agree with you. I think, you know, you made a big push also for living donors and, and improving that within the minorities, and I think that's where we can test and um, really try to get the best results. Yes. Um, uh, De Deanna, do we have time for one more final question? Sure. It's again, uh, it's a minute to three o'clock. Um, I was just wondering, Dr. Madeline, is there, um, you know, I suspect these kind of discrepancies with minorities exist also in other developing countries, and is there anything that, you know, um, in your uh, experience that you've seen or heard at conferences or in your travels that maybe you'd like to see introduced um, here in the U.S.? Sure. 
you know, it, it's interesting when we look at the incidence of prostate cancer in, in black men in, on the continent of Africa, they actually have a lower incidence of prostate cancer compared to their African-American counterparts, uh, which just emphasizes that it, it's not just all hereditary or genetic, it's and part of it's environmental, you know, types of uh, food that we eat, uh, smoking and drinking, um, you know, these things actually uh, help contribute. Some of the other countries or many of the, uh, the uh, industrialized nations uh, also have health disparities, but, and we've heard about this in, in the news and we talk about it all the time. I, I think the need for universal access to health care is, is something that we should be striving for. Um, everybody should have the right to, to be able to see a doctor to access the health care system to be screened for these conditions, hypertension, diabetes, and, and other conditions. And, and so, you know, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, United States, um, wealthy nation, that we don't um, have access to health care for everyone. I think that's something that the medical profession, you know, advocates and, and, and really strives for. I think if that were the case, we could reduce a lot of these, uh, you know, health disparities that of which I spoke. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you. Yana, back t to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Modlin. That was really good. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, it looks like uh, oh, just one comment here. Totally agree with universal health care. Um, okay. But it looks like that just about wraps up our Q&A discussion. So on behalf of the Alliance, I'd just like to extend a sincere thanks to both Dr. Modlin and Dr. Latifi for putting together um, such a well-rounded and comprehensive discussion on the cultural perspectives of African Americans and organ donation. Um, we truly appreciate both of your efforts, so thank you for that. And um, to our participants, we thank you for your continued participation, and we hope you all continue to stay safe um, during this time. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.